أعود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين. The soldiers went out one by one. None will be left before it's done. Hussein looked at Ali Akbar and knew the time for him had come. O oh, Ali Akbar, let us see the face of truth and prophecy. Your smiles, the universe to us, your eyes are paradise to me. But now his body lies there dead. Hussein, it's all just as he said. The one who looked just like Rasul, his turbans bloody on his head. The one who looked just like Rasul, his turbans bloodied on his head. قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون فرحين بما أتاهم الله من فضله ويستبشرون بالذين لم يلحقوا بهم من خلفهم على خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون عملنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات Uh, we're going to continue today with a subject I understand you were discussing last night, uh, and that is the illustrious figure of Hazrat Ali al-Akbar, peace be upon him. Uh, and of course, we respect all of the shahada of Karbala and the family of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Uh, however, why perhaps I'm giving this name some uh, special respect, uh, inshallah, will be clear throughout this discussion. I'm going to embark on something we don't often necessarily hear about, although it's a very obvious subject. It may be discussed from time to time. And that is, what do we actually know about Ali al-Akbar, peace be upon him? Uh, because when it comes to the lives of the uh, shuhada of Karbala, or for that matter, even the lives of the imams before their imamate, uh, such as the life of Ali Imam al-Hussein, alayhi salam, before Karbala, we don't actually hear very much. And if you open a biography, I'm sure you've had this experience. You sometimes want to know more about the life of Sayyidah Zainab, peace be upon her, or Imam Hussein. Sometimes you open the biography and it's about everything but them, right? It's about their times, the political situation, it's about Saqifa. And you find maybe only a few pages that you can actually say, according to our modern standards, this is about their actual lives. Now, this isn't some great conspiracy by biographers. And there's a couple things going on here. One, of course, is that in the, um, in the tradition which we inherited as Muslims, there was a great focus on genealogy. And we will discuss genealogy today, uh, in part because I think there is a lesson in that to be had. Uh, but that was a focus when discussing people uh, among the Arabs of the prophetic era. But also, to be honest, we do have a limited amount of material on these figures, for whatever reason. Of the material we have, uh, some people might question the reliability of some of it. So it can actually be quite difficult to present a... Um, a lengthy discussion on their lives. I don't claim to have a great uh, amount of detailed findings, but these are some things that are found uh, really scattered uh, throughout our books uh, with respect to his life. And inshallah, we will be able to derive some general lessons about that. So uh, one of the things I think we can look at with respect to Hazrat Ali Akbar, peace be upon him, is whether or not, or not the greatness of a person lies in their ancestry or in their actions. Is it as the Arab genealogists used to imply that one's worth comes from one's ancestry, especially one's paternal ancestry? Uh, or is it in the choices we make as human beings? Today, of course, we do tend to focus on the latter. One could very much argue that Islam also focuses on the latter, that I am not accountable for what my parents do or we're not accountable for what our descendants do. We are accountable for ourselves and we will stand before Allah uh, with respect to the choices that we make for ourselves. However, 
And I'm going to insert this point here because I do think it's important. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we have inherited a tribalistic view of history. And the li historical literature that we have about Karbala treats it in the light of tribal alliances, tribal relationships, and tribal conflict. So I'm sure all of us have heard the account of Karbala as relating to a, an essential tribal disagreement between the Umayyads and the Hashemites, or going back uh, even before the time of the Holy Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his family. Uh, and many times, you know, uh, Islamic history is cast in this uh, genealogical light. I am personally of the view that I think this is something we should be thoughtful of, and if we choose to present history that way, be mindful of the fact that we are taking a approach which uh, may or may not necessarily be the approach that the Imams the, and Holy Prophet, peace be upon all of them, wanted us to take. Uh, at least I am very cautious about uh, putting too much of a tribalistic focus when retelling sacred history. I just want to put that point out there. Uh, it's up to you what you choose to do with it because it is very entrenched in our mindset and we don't we don't even think about it. I mean, I remember once I was asked to teach, teach at a weekend school, Medrasa, uh, for students, and they gave me a book to teach Islamic history. And that's basically what it was about. It was a book that was in Arabic and they expected me to translate it. And I just take this, took this very uh, tribal approach, uh, Abdul Shams, Abdul Manaf, and so forth. Uh, anyway, um, it is something we've inherited, but is that always uh, the best way to look at things? And going back to the topic, one of the interesting things we see about Ali al-Akbar, he be upon him, is that he does have a very complex lineage. And of course, from the father's side, uh, we can only say good. I mean, he's the son of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. And, you know, obviously one of the most shining and illustrious examples for humanity of all time. Uh, of course, uh, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, Imam Ali, Fatima to Zahra. Uh, so obviously from his father's side, he's got the, the best of the best. And so sometimes when you look at these genealogical charts, they'll only list that side. Uh, it's from his mother's side that it actually gets a little bit more complicated. Um, now, of course, again, uh, part of this tribalistic approach in our history books is we do tend to focus a lot on paternal relatives who really are a bit distant. And so when we look at Ali al-Akbar, uh, he is descended from one of the Sahaba named Urwa ibn Mas'ud uh, Thaqafi. Uh, so this is obviously going a couple generations back, and there are other people in his family. Uh, but insofar as this was present in people's minds, uh, as we will get to, and insofar as this is an interesting uh, link. Uh, now this Urwa ibn Mas'ud, uh, he's referred to in the Holy Quran before he converted to Islam. So he's in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Uh, but he was an enemy of the Prophet at that time, or an adversary one can say. Uh, and it's related that the Kuffar uh, were asking, you know, why isn't the Holy Quran sent down to one of our tribal chiefs, basically? Uh, uh, why is not the Holy Quran sent down to one of these uh, two men of these two great tribes, basically? Uh, one of them being Urwa ibn Mas'ud. So the Kuffar, or the, the people who did not accept the message, uh, felt that he is the better person because of his status, his lineage, his authority, and so forth. And of course, the ethical message in the ayah is that we don't judge people based on their worldly status. You base them on their consciousness of God and their ethics and so forth, and that Allah chooses his prophet. It's not for the people to say, yes, this is the celebrity person among us, so they're going to be our prophet. Uh, however, tafsir-wise, this does relate to uh, Hazrat Ali al-Akbar's um, paternal uh, grandfather, um, or great-grandfather, paternal ancestor anyway, uh, in the grandfatherly line. Uh, Thakafi, of course, there's a very famous Thakafi among us, uh, well, not literally among us, uh, Al-Mukhtar, uh, of course, very, very famous because of the movie, right? Uh, what is Al-Mukhtar known for? He's known for being brave, for being valorous, for being honorable, for being chivalrous. And these were said to be traits held by the tribe of Thaqif in general, who were a noble tribe. You know, they weren't, um, I don't know, people uh, eking out a, a bare minimum living. They were people who were known, to, they had status, and they were also known for upholding these value, values of valor and so forth. Uh, so this is part of his lineage. And uh, now Urwa ibn Mas'ud, the companion, a Thaqafi, the um, paternal ancestor of Hazrat Ali al-Akbar, he did convert to Islam. 
Uh, and it is related that uh, he was actually killed because of his conversion. This, this is mentioned anyway in the literature about the Sahaba, uh, that he, go, he accepts the prophetic message, he goes to his people, he invites them to Islam, uh, and then the people gathered around and killed him. They, they shot him to death with bows and arrows. Uh, so, uh, and it, it is related that his last words that this is were this was an honor granted to me by God, the honor to grant to die as a martyr in His cause. Uh, and it's related. Uh, this is mentioned in Nafas al Mahmum, although obviously uh, it's not the original source. Uh, that the Prophet ﷺ said that Urwa is similar, or the example of Urwa ibn Mas'ud is like the example of the believer in Surat Yasin. So the person in Surah Yasin who tries to um, bring the people to faith, uh, in that he invited his people towards worshipping God and his people killed him. So we have an example of someone who's actually uh, converted to Islam during the prophetic era in the uh, paternal line of Hazrat Ali al-Akbar uh, and is killed for his faith. So I'd say that's a pretty good example uh, and there are good footsteps to follow in. I mean, Ali al-Akbar also, he is a shaheed uh, descended from someone who is killed for the sake of his faith. So where is the complexity? Uh, the complexity, of course, is on his mother's side, uh, who was a relative of, uh, of Abu Sufyan. Uh, basically, um, so this would have made uh, Abu Sufyan, Ali al-Akbar's mother's um, ancestor, at any rate. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to work out what we're supposed to call these uh, relatives. Uh, but Urwa was married to Maimuna bint uh, Abu Sufyan, uh, so that made him a grandson of Abu Sufyan. So basically that made Ali al-Akbar's mother also a cousin of Yazid, to, to say it plainly. Uh, and so obviously this is a very different kinlink. So we actually have someone who's uh, by blood related to both the Umayyads and the Hashemites. So you've got basically the best and the worst, to put it bluntly, by, by blood. Now, blood, of course, does not dictate one's life, but it is a, a thought-provoking mix. It is a reminder that in this era, there were a lot of complex uh, tribal and marriage relationships that cross a lot of these boundaries we have today. Uh, of course, to make it more complicated, uh, although she is uh, related to the Umayyads, uh, her aunt was actually married to Imam Ali, peace be upon him. So again, we've got a very complex uh, link here. Uh, and it's interesting that um, this is related um, from Abu Faraj al-Isfahani, uh, someone who wrote a lot of biographical accounts and so forth. Um, it's related that Muawiyah once asked, uh, but it's related that he once asked who is most worthy of the caliphate. So this is Muawiyah speaking. Uh, so the people, of course, knowing the correct answer to the question, they said, you, Muawiyah, you are the most worthy of the caliphate. Obviously, they're going to say that. And he says, no. And according to this account, uh, it goes without saying this is not a Shi'i account, this is a, a Sunni account. It says, no, the worst, most worthy person for the Khilafah is Ali ibn al-Hussein, uh, ibn Ali, because he has three things. So again, Muawiyah is answering according to the tribal ethos of the time. He's not speaking of Ali al-Akbar's personal qualities, although, of course, he could speak of them, but he speaks about his lineage. He says he combines the valor of Beni Hashim, so the, you know, the battle prowess and bravery of Imam Ali, uh, the generosity, we'll put some quotations marks around this, generosity of Beni Umayya, and the honor of the uh, tribe of Thaqif, because again, al Muqtar's tribe was known for being very honorable, keeping their word, uh, not fighting deviously, and so forth. So at any rate, this sort of account does indicate uh, an awareness uh, of the complexity of this sort of situation. Uh, and it does mean that, you know, sometimes we might assume someone who comes from a certain lineage is predestined, although even with the Umayyads, we don't see that uh, necessarily. But uh, nonetheless, on the day of Ashura, this did come up. It came up both with respect to Ali al-Akbar and also Hazar Abbas, peace be upon them. Uh, actually, uh, also before the day of Ashura, uh, what is said to Hazrat Abbas? 
peace be upon him. What offer is made? Uh, it's related that Shimr, uh, said, where are the sons of our sister? Where is Abbas and our brothers? And then they offered to Hazrat Abbas that you are secure. You have a relationship to us, so come to our side. We will not hold you to account accountable. You know, don't, don't give your life like this. There's no need for you to get killed. Come and be secure with us. And now, incidentally, I have heard the ex uh, commentary on this uh, narration that perhaps this is not meaning that uh, Hazrat Abbas is a direct uh, relative uh, of uh, this particular individual, but it's sort of a general relative for marriage. In any case, th there was a relationship by blood or by marriage such that the enemies offered him immunity. So he has a choice. He could take the choice. He could say, thank you, you know, I, I've come with you this far, uh, and this is all. Of course, God forbid he's not going to do that. He says, curse, the curse of Allah be upon you and your security. Are you offering this while the son of the messenger of Allah has no security at all? And are you ordering us to be obedient to these people whom uh, Allah ha is basically sending to hell uh, for their deeds, of course? So Hazrat Abbas, peace be upon him, he has offered this. And he says no. So he has the choice and he takes the choice. Uh, similarly, on the day of Ashura, something very similar is related with respect to uh, Ali al-Akbar. As someone says, Ali, you have a blood relationship with uh, Yazid and we wish to safeguard this. We don't wish to fight our own kinsmen so we can grant you security. Uh, so he's, again, he could have been at a crossroads. I'm not saying he would have been. I'm saying he could have been. And, he's, and uh, it's related, he said, no, the relationship I have with the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayh, is more worthy of being safeguarded. This is the choice I make to stand with the Prophet, to stand with Imam Hussein. And then at that point, it's related, he said his famous words, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali, Nahnu wa Rabbul Bayt, Awla bin Nabi. Um, which has been uh, rendered into English. I am Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali. I swear by the Kaaba, uh, none uh, is better for the caliphate than we. A illegitimate son will not judge us by his wicked whim. Our chaste house is where Muslim's true guidance doth stem. In defense of my father, I will strike with my sword with the blow of a Hashemite who serves the great Lord. And of course, this is impromptu poetry narrated uh, from them on the day of Ashura, uh, not dissimilar to what is related with respect to Hazrat Abbas, peace be upon him. Uh, when he reaches uh, the river, uh, what does he say when he sees the water in front of him? Uh, he's very thirsty. Uh, he's very exhausted. He could have drank the water and renewed his strength, and no one would have blamed him. Uh, he says, Ya nafsim min ba'ad al Husseini huni wa ba'aduhu la kunti an takuni. O self, before you is Hussein, not after him should you remain. Can you quench your thirst that wants him slain? It's not the faith that you maintain. Uh, so, this was the kind of eloquence that is. Uh, related from them. So both of them are actually offered the opportunity to take, uh, to have a way out of the battle on the day of Ashura, and they both decline and prefer to give their lives instead in the way of Allah Ta'ala. So that's just a bit about the genealogy of Hazrat uh, Ali al-Akbar, peace be upon him. Now, one of the more um, detail-oriented questions that comes up is when was he born? And ho how old was he uh, in, on the day of Ashura? Uh, generally, we, myself included, do get a mental image of him as being in his late teens. For whatever reason, this is um, the portrayal we use. Uh, historically speaking, there are actually a couple different viewpoints uh, which re relate to whether or not he was older or younger than Imam al-Sajjad, uh, peace be upon him. And when Kim surmised, there is a confusion in the historical books, probably because both of them were named Ali ibn al Hussein. So maybe some people uh, mixed up these two names. Uh, the dominant view that you find among researchers and historians is that Ali al Akbar was uh, born uh, in Sha'aban in the 33rd year Hijri. Uh, so uh, he would have been um, a bit older than we imagine. Uh, during the events uh, surrounding Karbala, albeit there is a minority view which says he is a bit younger than Imam al-Sajjad. Uh, and the idea that he was older than Imam al-Sajjad, many of us uh, have heard it many times because it's related in the dialogue between Imam al-Sajjad and Ibn Ziyad. 
When Ibn Ziyad asks Imam Sajjad, peace be upon him, uh, who are you? And he says, I am Ali ibn al-Hussein. And he says, you know, obviously a very devious statement, he says, did not Allah kill Ali ibn al-Hussein? Uh, meaning my forces killed Ali ibn al-Hussein, but he's blaming Allah, as we were discussing uh, the other day. And he says, no, I had an older brother named Ali ibn al-Hussein, and you killed him. Uh, so the... Dominant view, as I mentioned, um, is that he is a little bit older than many of us do tend to envision. Um, without getting too much into the life and times, just to put this in some historical, pers in historical perspective, um, to make a sort of mental timeline, if you will. Um, at the time of his birth, uh, Al-Imam Hussein salam, would have been about in his late 20s, if any of you are in this age group, uh, maybe you even have children. Uh, and Imam Sajjad, peace be upon him, would have been born about four years later. Um, now, in the 35th year Hijri, so Ali al-Akbar would have been about two years old, Imam Ali formally accepted the Khilafah, and they moved to Kufa. So everything is moved to Kufa now. And Imam Ali was killed only a few years later, so in 40 AH, or when Ali al-Akbar would have been seven, according to this. And at that point, um, the Umayyads took power. There's the peace treaty between Imam Hassan and Muawiyah, and then the events in Karbala take place in the 61st year of Hijri. So this, of course, is a time of great change for the Muslim world. Uh, so that is, in any case, um, a point that biographers oftentimes bring up. Uh, now, a question that sometimes people ask, too, and again, this points to the... Um, paucity of literature in our sources and where sometimes we need to look at a sort of um, oblique way to find out things about people. Some people might ask, was he married? Did he have children? And again, I think many of us, myself included, do have a mental image of him as being someone who never had the opportunity to marry and never had the opportunity uh, to have children. Uh, salawat. <coughs> Albeit there are a couple of sources that do indicate the opposite. What are these sources? Uh, one of them is the ziyarat of the uh, shohada uh, itself, when we say, sallallahu alayk ya abel hassan, to refer to him. So we are instructed by the imams to refer to Hazrat Ali al-Akbar, peace be upon him, as Abu al-Hassan. So that is to say he has a kunya uh, with respect to the name of his eldest son, who would have been Hassan. And now some people might argue, well, kunyas are given honorifically sometimes. Maybe it doesn't literally mean he had a son named uh, Al-Hassan. Uh, but it is an indication that he possibly had a son by that name. Um, and this is actually mentioned in a couple ziyarat uh, that we have, because we know we have a number of ziyarat texts given us to us by the imams, not only the ones we typically uh, tend to read uh, very frequently. Uh, there's also a narration in Al-Kafi, which... Um, it uh, relates to a completely different subject, uh, but it gives him as an example and mentions that he was married to a, a slave girl, an Umm Walid, uh, and had a son named Hassan. And then after that, uh, after he was killed, uh, she was married to Imam Zain al-Abidin. So the question is, is this marriage permissible? And, and the answer is yes. So this is something also, that's, again, it's mentioned very tangential, tangentially, but it does suggest that he was married and did have a child or children uh, at the time. Um, which, at least to me, um, that was a bit of a surprise uh, when I first realized that. Um, now, one of the things that biographers will oftentimes focus on uh, with respect to him is uh, the words of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, on the day of Ashura, which I'm sure you were discussing yesterday, um, when the Imam sees him go into battle. He sees he looks just like the Holy Prophet, you know, someone who's very um, innocent, uh, very good. And he says, Allahumma ishhad ala ha'ula al qawm O oh Allah, bear witness against these people. فَقَدْ بَرَزَ إِلَيْهِمْ غُلَامِ Because a young man has uh, ridden out to them in battle. أَشْبَهَ النَّاسِ خَلْقًا وَخُلُقًا وَمُنْطِقًا إِلَى رَسُولَكَ um, That the person most resembling your prophet in three ways has come forth. What are these three ways? Uh, his uh, appearance, خَلْقًا uh, His manner, خُلُقًا And his speech, مُنْطِقًا now, Montaqan, we've already looked at briefly with respect to the extemporaneous, extemporaneous poetry that is narrated on Ashura. Uh, khalqan wa khulqan. 
Um, one of the accounts that is related with respect to the appearance of Hazrat Ali Akbar, peace be upon him, and how he resembled the Holy Prophet. And of course, this is something that is even said with respect to the, the women when they bade farewell to Ali Akbar, that it was very sad for them because not only are they saying farewell to someone who is very beloved to them, but also they're saying farewell to someone who they used to look at to remember the Holy Prophet. Uh, Hazrat Zainab, for example, who still was at an age that she could remember the Holy Prophet. Peace be upon him and his family. In any case, there's account, an account that says once a Christian man entered the Masjid al Nabawi. This is after the prophetic era. Some of the less guided Muslims, because unfortunately there were some less guided people in the community, they told him that you can't be in here because you're a Christian, not unlike today in certain countries uh, in the Hejaz. Uh, of course, this is not how the prophet was, this is not how the imams were. And we know the imams used to teach people of all faiths. Imam Sadiq had people from all faiths and all schools of thought, but these people, you know, their mentality is a little bit limited. Um, so uh, the man tells them, he insists, he said, yes, uh, I was a Christian, but I had a dream last night that I saw the prophet of Allah with uh, Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, and he says, Jesus became Muslim at the hand of the last prophet, and so I feel that your prophet is a true prophet. And I became Muslim, you know, in the, um, you know, Alim al ghaib uh, when he's uh, having a dream or, you know, maybe a true dream of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And now I wish to also renew my allegiance to the Prophet and to Islam at the hand of one of his descendants. So the people, um, they brought him to see Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Maybe they didn't know what else to do with him. So he falls to the feet of Imam Hussein. He begins kissing the feet of Imam Hussein. And then he tells him about the dream he had. So Imam Hussein asks the man, according to this account, do you wish to see someone who looks just like the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, uh, who the man has been dreaming about? So he says, yes, Sayyidi. So Imam Hussein calls for Ali al-Akbar, who according to the narration, uh, his face was covered at the time. And then he uncovered his face and the man was so astonished at this re resemblance that he, um, he lost consciousness briefly. Uh, and then Imam Hussein says to the man when he recovers, my son resembles my grandfather, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And the man says, yes, by Allah, he does look exactly like the person I saw in my dream. And then Imam Hussein says to him, if you had a son like him and he was just pricked by a thorn, how would you feel? And he says that I would die if that happened to me. And then the Imam tells him that I can foresee my son here, you know, this young man who looks so much like the Prophet being cut to pieces with swords. So this uh, is respect to Khulqan and the appearance. Uh, Khulqan, of course, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as the Holy Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ that the Prophet is, has the best um, way of dealing with people and the character. And of course, uh, we would say the same thing definitely for the uh, renowned figures from Ahl al-Bayt, whether it's the Imams or people such as Bibi Zainab or uh, Hazrat Ali al-Akbar. Uh, and Mantiqan, we also spoke of as well. And as a matter of fact, these are some points that uh, some authors will develop at great length. Uh, there are a couple things that are a little bit more obscure that you can find in our literature. Uh, one of the things that is, one of the titles that is given to Hazrat Ali al-Akbar, uh, peace be upon him, in some of the ziyarat texts uh, is, As-salamu alayka ya wali Allah wa ibn wali. Peace be upon you, the wali Allah of Allah and the son of his wali. Now, as we were discussing uh, last week when I was here, the shuhada of Karbala in general are referred to as awliya Allah. Now, what is awliya Allah? Of course, this is a tremendously difficult term to render into English. I mean, sometimes we say the wali Allah is the friend of Allah. You could say he's the person who's close to Allah, entrusted by Allah. Uh, my, I think my personal explanation would be the narration that says that with respect to the wali Allah, they're so close to God that their act is God's act. So that their hand uh, does not act according to their own will, but acts according to God's will. They speak according to the will of God. Uh, they're... Um, Spirituality is so aligned with the divine that it's as if they are acting uh, almost on behalf of the divine. Or I would say on behalf, but I don't want to get accused of ghulu here. So I'll say uh, almost on behalf. But the point is there is this um, synchronousness between them. 
Uh, in any case, it is true that in general refer to the shuhada as the awliya Allah uh, in general. Uh, but this is a very specific phrase. Uh, Assalamu alayka ya wali Allah wa ibn wali. Uh, it is actually a, you know, a very specific attribution to Hazrat Ali al-Akbar, peace be upon him. And it, with respect to the awliya Allah, uh, one of the prophetic narrations is that the awliya Allah or the wali, people who are wali Allah are those who reflect Allah's attributes in their character. So khalqan wa khuluqan wa mantiqan. Uh, their devotion to Allah and uh, godliness inspire others to have the same spir- spirit of submission to Allah. They're always remembering Allah. Every act of theirs is a lesson. Their speech, anything they say is based on wisdom. They are a blessing from God among people. They are restless with the fear of Allah, lest they ever do something, God forbid, that might invoke the wrath of Allah. And they are eager to receive the blessings of Allah. They always do good to others and safeguard themselves against evil. Uh, and as Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran about the awliya Allah, Ala inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. That the uh, awliya Allah, there is no fear upon them and nor shall they grieve. Uh, now, along these lines, this is a very unusual narration. Uh, it is in a book of Nawadir, meaning rare narrations. Uh, in any case, it's related that the narrator saw uh, Ali al-Akbar uh, when he was a young boy, so before, way before the events in Karbala. Uh, and he was a, a child, and he wanted to have grapes, according to the narration, but it was out of the season. And one would guess there is a point behind this narration because obviously even a child would understand that there are certain times of year where we simply can't get things. Uh, so he says to his father, al Hussein, peace be upon him, Abah inish to hate Ainaban, oh my father, I would like grapes. Uh, so it says that al Hussein, peace be upon him, he strikes the uh, pillar in the masjid and he took from it grapes and bananas in outside of their season, uh, like is in some of the accounts with respect to uh, Bibi Maryam, uh, the Virgin Mary, peace be upon her. And he gave them to him, and then he said, uh, my son, this is from the fadl, or the you know, uh, bounty of, of what Allah has granted us. And then it gets to the point, uh, he turns to us and says, but uh, what is with Allah for the awliya Allah or the wali Allah is uh, better than that. Uh, that this is just a, a very ordinary miracle. You know, food, of course, it is important. Uh, we, it's necessary, but this is nothing compared to what the capacity of the awliya Allah is or what uh, Allah uh, would, would grant them uh, due to their spiritual status. And we do have any number of narrations about these sorts of miracles surrounding the imams. Even today we see many miracles surrounding them. So it would not be impossible. Uh, it, it is a, a different sort of narration. Uh, and there is one other that is very similar uh, as well. And this is in some of the um, some of the accounts on the day of Ashura. And it relates to a narration in the Sunni books about Imam Ali, alayhi uh, salam. It says, uh, in the Sunni books, it says uh, that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said, لا تسبوا عليين um, God forbid, of course, do not curse Ali, فإنه ممسوس في ذات الله تعالى. Because he is someone who is touched by or engulfed in or next to uh, the essence of Allah Ta'ala, uh, the Dhat Allah. So, <coughs> you know, of course, it would not be unusual for the Holy Prophet, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. It would not be unusual for the Holy Prophet to uh, predict what is going to happen in the future and that there will come a time when people would curse Imam Ali, peace be upon him. So for him to say this narration or, or this hadith is not um, definitely nothing unusual. Uh, the description of Imam Ali alayhi salam, as someone who is connected to the essence of Allah, this is, I think we would agree with this. Yes, he's someone who's very close to the essence of Allah. Is he not someone who, when asked if he sees Allah, says, would I worship someone whom I do not see? So that he senses or sees the presence of Allah with the eye of his heart. Uh, so this is with respect to Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, peace be upon him, uh, in some of the Sunni books. Uh, this is also related with respect to the day of Ashura. Um, uh, according to the account, when Ali al-Akbar was preparing to go out for battle, uh, he went to say farewell uh, to the women. 
Uh, and they were greatly distressed to see him go out and be killed, especially after so many shohada had been killed. Uh, and so the imam says to them, he says, leave them. فَإِنَّهُ مَمْسُوسْ فِي ذَاتْ وَمَقْتُولْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ uh, Leave him because he, he uses the same phrase, he is... Uh, you know, with the uh, essence of Allah. You know, he is attached to the essence of Allah uh, and he is going to be killed in the path of Allah Ta'ala. So this shahada, is, this martyrdom is coming very soon uh, and he's going to take his final step towards Allah Ta'ala. Uh, and this is really, again, a very evocative phrase. Uh, and of course, um, already, you know, we say that he, along with the rest of the shahada of Karbala, are at this very high level. But to describe him, uh, even at this point, uh, despite not being one of the ma'asumin, uh, formally speaking, like we say the 12 imams and Bibi Fatima and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, are the you know, formal ma'asumin in the Islamic era. Nonetheless, to describe him as being, um, ten, if you will, tangential t in the sense of touching uh, the essence of Allah is really a very, um, a very heavy statement and a very thought-provoking statement. Uh, something I think about sometimes when we hear Assalamu alayhi wa Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al-Hussein uh, wa ala awlad al-Hussein wa ala ashab al-Hussein that there is a, a special mention of Hazrat Ali al-Akbar uh, that we mention on the day of Ashura. Uh, and of course, um, one of the most famous conversations that I'm sure you uh, mentioned last night was when on their way to Karbala, uh, he overhears his father al-Hussein alayhi salam repeating inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong, and to Allah we return, and praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So we know uh, that Ali Akbar, peace be upon him, asks his father, why is it that you are saying this? And the imam tells him that I fell asleep for a moment, and I saw a horseman saying, these people are marching as fate marches towards them. So I realized that we ourselves are the ones who are being spoken of and eulogized and lamented. And Ali Akbar says these famous words, are we not in the right? And the Imam says, yes, by the one to all of his servants, Allah's servants will return to him, we are in the right. Then, oh my father, we do not mind dying as long as we are in the right. So this is, in fact, the decision that he made at that point on the day of Ashura, when some people offered him the decision to leave. But of course, he stands with the Imam. Inshallah, may we all do the same as well. Uh, and so Ali al-Akbar was among the latter shohada to fall. But the moment came where there was virtually no one left in the camp who could stand for the imam. And one of those last people to fall on this night was Hazrat Abbas, peace be upon him. And of course, Hazrat Abbas, someone who's remembered for his valor, his bravery, his chivalry, and one of the shuhada who did not fall in battle. He did not fa fall intending to go out and fight with the sword. We know he went out to... Uh, on the mission to collect water, especially for the children uh, who were parched with thirst. Uh, as one of the poets has said, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, you're the bravest one of us. Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, you're the bravest one of us. As you're daring to bring water, they're preparing your slaughter. And, and the many enemies, in fact, despite the fact that there were so many of them, still they were very intimidated by Hazrat Abbas. Uh, and he was able to actually get through to the Euphrates, whereupon he declined to drink water and instead uh, would not drink before his imam. Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, you're the bravest one of us. As you're daring to bring water, you're preparing, they're preparing your slaughter. And then what happens, happens. Oh, flag bearer, where's your hand? Is it bleeding on the sand? Will Sakina understand you fulfilled her last command? So Al Abbas, he fell. Ali al Akbar had fallen. One by one, the companions, the shuhada, had returned to their lord. Who was left? There was one soldier of the Imam who was left. And one of the accounts of this that I think is most heart-wrenching is respect, with respect to what is mentioned after the events of Ashura, uh, when Al-Mukhtar's forces captured uh, Harmala, la'antallahi alayh, and they had all of the um, enemies uh, of Allah who were captured confess to their crimes. Uh, and Harmala, although he was a very cruel person, he said, he confessed, he bore witness himself that on the day of Ashura, I shot three arrows. 
But among these arrows that I shot on the day of Ashura, there's only one of them that really breaks my heart. So they told him, tell us what it is you did on the day of Ashura against Imam Hussein and the companions of Hussein and the family of Hussein and the family of the Prophet He says, with one arrow, I shot it at the heart of al Hussein. I shot at the Imam, but this is not the arrow that breaks my own heart. And one of my arrows I shot at the eye of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. I am the one who put out the eye of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas so the, that he couldn't see as he fell from his horse and as he realized he would not be able to bring water back to the camp. But this was not the arrow that broke my heart. No, there was one arrow that still, I cannot get it out of my mind. And it was a very large arrow that I used, much larger than I needed to do. And I took it and I aimed it at the neck of that child, the young infant child of al Hussein. I aimed the arrow and it struck him in the neck. The blood was flowing from the neck of that child. He was so thirsty, he didn't have any water. The imam was holding him out, begging the people that if I've committed a sin, then come and take my life. But what sin has this baby committed? What sin has this six-month-old committed for you to make him die of thirst like this? And then he took the baby, he held him up, and I took the arrow and I shot it, and I slaughtered the child. He says, for the bahtahu min al-wareedi ila al-wareed. I slaughtered the child. And I watched as his blood flowed into the arms of his father. His father, al Hussein looked up to the heavens. His family had been killed. His brother, Abbas, had been killed. His small band of supporters had been killed. And now he was standing there with his child, holding him up to Allah. The last sacrifice. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un wa sayyalamu alladhina zhalamu ayyamun qadabin yanqadibun wa la'aqibatu lil muttaqeen.